Hey, this is video 101 of Uncovering the Missing Secrets of Magnetism. I've uh, been asked this question a lot, and it's important to answer. This video might seem dry and boring at first, but just watch a little bit, and uh, then you'll have an insight into something extremely important, a la instantaneous action at a distance. And uh, my uh, discovery of... Uh, the formula for magnetic reciprocation, centrifugal and centripetal reciprocation of divergence and convergence of a, uh, of a magnetic uh, object, or actually a magnetic subject. And let me quickly grab over here the uh, very heavy and dangerous 35-pound neodymium iron boron, this enormous, this enormous 35-pound beast, this 800 is $800 magnet, which I can barely hold up with one hand. I'm going to step back uh, 14 feet. I'm going to let you look at the cathode ray tube, and you will see that uh, there are effects on the cathode ray tube from this uh, neodymium magnet. Now, while this is not an insanely powerful magnet on its Gauss rating, it has enormous volume. So, let me step back 14 feet and have you look Actually, let me change the color fields on the camera first. Let me change the color fields to white so you can see it better. There you go. Oh, this magnet is just dangerous as hell. Okay. Now you're seeing action. I'm right at 14 feet away from the cathode ray tube. Just flicking this ginormous neodymium back and forth slowly and you can see the effect on the cathode ray tube. And the question is regarding instantaneous action at a distance and my mathematic formula I discovered for, uh, for magnetic divergence and convergence there's absolutely no possible way that instantaneous action at a distance these magnetic force line vectors, these force and motion vectors, should be affecting anything on the cathode ray tube. So, what's the question? Well, magnetism is not a field, as I was going to get into deeply into the book. Magnetism is, is force and motion. It is a field ether modality, a disturbance of the ether. So, what's a quick analogy without going into a 50-page diatribe, like I'll have to do into the book. How is it that... Sorry, that magnet is both very dangerous and extremely heavy. How is it that I'm actually getting reciprocation far beyond at 14 feet? That's way far beyond, by about 10 feet, roughly. My mathematical formula for, for a magnetic reciprocation, all of that large neodymium magnet. The answer is simple. I hate to use a Star Wars analogy of like a disturbance in the force, but uh, it's uh, for an analogy. Let's let's just go with that for a second without getting into details. Imagine we have a magnet as a person. Say a magnet is a person, and it's in the middle of an extremely large lake that's absolutely calm. We only know the the magnet as a person. We obviously cannot that cannot see magnetic uh, force vectors emanating from this person, i.e. our magnet. So, if from our presumption, since we're talking about force and motion uh, centrifugal vectors, uh, force and motion centrifugal vectors emanating and reciprocating from our magnet in compression and rarefaction from north to south and vice versa, centrifugally and centripetally, how is it that we're getting this? If from the analogy of our person in the lake, in a perfectly calm lake, we would assume that magnetism as a crude analogy to a person in the lake would be like a person that has thousand foot arms. Well this person has thousand foot arms and he's flapping his arms out in the middle of a perfectly calm lake and we're getting ether and dielectric uh, modality disturbances, you know, way, way out here. So this person, i.e. our magnet, must have thousand foot arms, or say, in our case, 14 foot arms. So we're having, we have a 14 foot and likely much further, although much less perceivable, uh, force vector disturbances in the ether. Well, that's not the case. Our person has normal arms, obviously arm length varies, but in the analogy of our person, not to take the analogy too far, the, uh, our person has normal arms. What he's doing is he's splashing out in a perfectly calm lake, 
just like our magnetic divergence and convergent field reciprocations. He's splashing his arms out in the lake. He's obviously, as you very well know, would be creating waves, disturbances in the lake. Far, far, far beyond the, the reach of his, let's say, let's say six foot span of arm length. So he's actually having water disturbances far, far beyond that. So his arms don't stretch any further than that. What he's doing, he's disturbing the force and motion and inertia and acceleration vectors of the ether. Remember, there are no fields in space. Space is a posterior attribute to field divergences. Not field convergences, because field convergences, which I'll explain in the book in the upcoming book, I've got like 300 more pages to add. Not convergences, i.e. inertia and acceleration, but force and motion vectors. We have, we have as disturbances of force and motion vectors at distance from our magnet. So, just like our person in the lake doesn't have 100 foot arms, even though he's causing disturbances, you know, say 100 feet, 200 feet from his splashing arms out in a perfectly calm large body of water. The same is true of our magnet. That is also why there is no discrepancy in my uh, discovery of the mathematical formula of the divergent and convergent fields of a magnet if we know its radius. There's actually quite a few variables but we actually take the mean whole that my, my formula uh, accurately uh, predicts the uh, divergent and convergent field vectors of a magnet. So, just like our person, our magnet doesn't have that 100 foot arms, shall we say, as an analogy. Let me grab the magnet again. So, that's the explanation for that. You need to understand that space is a posterior attribute to divergent field modalities. And what we have is, not to use a cheesy analogy from a movie, a disturbance in the force, but if that helps you understand it better without me getting into very elaborate detail, which I will in the book in the upcoming 4th and 5th editions. Right now I'm at uh, 13 feet behind the cathode ray tube. You see the disturbance? Let me put this magnet down. It's extremely dangerous and very heavy. So, that's the explanation for that. I've been asked that question a few times. If that helps you understand Magnetic field divergence is at distance, IAAD, instantaneous action at a distance. You see, it's absolutely ridiculous to even postulate, regardless of my mathematical formula for ma magnetic divergence and convergence, that magnetic divergence reaches far, far, far beyond the centrifugal edge of the magnet, dozens of feet and further, before it reconverges centripetally to the other side of the magnet or along the dielectric inertial plane. It's impossible, it's illogical, it doesn't follow force and motion, fluid dynamics, it doesn't follow anything. My formula is still 100% accurate. You have to understand that what is happening is you're causing a disturbance in the force and motion and inertia and acceleration homeostasis of the ever-present ether which is omnipresent, there is no point at which the ether can be pinpointed. You're talking about unmanifest inertia. You're causing a disturbance in the force in motion or inertia acceleration. Both combine. I'll explain it later in the book. So our magnet is not diverging way, way far upon this, uh, far upon uh, uh, beyond the centrifugal edge. Another thing I wanted to talk to you about really quickly is that if you want to understand the difference between inertia and acceleration, i.e. dielectric inertial plane, at the midpoint, not located at or cut or, uh, or, or uh, not located at the midpoint of a magnet, but concentrated at, forced at, just do like simplex uh, fluid dynamics, is you can think of a bicycle wheel with really, really tight spokes, and if you actually tighten those spokes, keep tightening those spokes around, you'll actually have a spoke actually spring up, pop out, it'll actually pop a spoke, it'll actually uh, pop its nut on the, either the rim or the center hub. If you could just imagine magnetism doing that endless trillions and trillions of times uh, and it's actually diverging and reconverging on the other side. So if you imagine a bicycle wheel with infinite spokes that are popping their spokes, if you imagine those tight spokes which have uh, zero manifest force and motion are emerging as force and motion, what they do is they reciprocate like broken uh, spokes on a bicycle wheel that are too tight. I don't know if you have ridden the old style type of a bicycle wheels that much, but if you know what I'm talking about, the, referring to like a broken spoke. That is uh, the Poincaré disc model, that is the hyperboloid that is the magnet. Remember a magnet is not an expression of field, it is a field modality of the loss of inertia. 
and acceleration, i.e. dielectricity, the unmanifest inertia that is the ether, ether and inertia are interchangeable. So, that is why our ginormous magnet is actually caught. I could actually use a much smaller magnet, I just have to bring it a little bit closer to the CRT tube. That is why our magnetic reciprocation is affecting the CRT tube from 14 feet away. It actually is affecting it further back, but we just can't see, can't actually see it on the CRT tube. So that is why the effects are occurring out there. You have disturbances in the force and motion and inertia and acceleration of the actual ether itself. So what is actually reaching out to the CRT tube and causing a disturbance in the dielectric uh, phosphors on the front of the CRT tube as the uh, the dielectric uh, the dielectric lines of uh, of, uh, of uh, electrification of the front of the, the back of the phosphorus tube are actually being affected by the magnet at such a great distance. The magnetism is not actually affecting that. What is affecting that is the actual ether that is being disturbed by the magnet that I was flicking back and forth. Just like our bicycle wheel and just like a person. If our magnet is a person and he's in perfectly calm lake, if you can understand that better as an analogy in your mind, a person splashing out in a perfectly calm lake, well, we assume that he's actually causing disturbance in the lake, say, a hundred thousand feet beyond where he's splashing. Well, he doesn't have thousand foot arms, obviously. He's actually causing a disturbance in the force in motion and the inertia acceleration. Inertia acceleration, as far as splashing water, would be analogous to surface tension of the water. And, of course, the waves and ripples would be phenomena. They would be force vector phenomena, just like electricity or electromagnetism. The waves of the water would be analogous to affecting the force and motion vectors of the water, i.e. analogous to the ether. And the actual disturbance, the longitudinal disturbance of the water would be affecting the inertia and acceleration, i.e. the surface tension of the water. That's like kind of a crude analogy, but... I've told it to some people, and it gives them a really good idea. A few people have gone, aha, I understand it now. So hopefully that gives you a better understanding of what's going on and also proves why, I'll give a bunch of later elaboration, why my formula is still accurate for uh, the spatial divergence and convergence of a magnet or magnetic uh, object or subject, as specifically we denote. Um, obviously there's several variables involved in that, but that is why we are getting magnetic divergent effects on our CRT tube so far away, far, far, far beyond what my magnetic formula refers to uh, that I discovered and that is in the third edition of the book, the formula for a field, uh, field reciprocation of a magnet, mean field reciprocation and convergence. So just like our person out in the water doesn't have thousand foot arms, it's the same thing with our magnet. I'm flopping it back and forth and of course, we are living in the unmanifest inertia that is absolutely omnipresent everywhere, i.e. the ether, and that is what the magnet is affecting. It is affecting force and motion and inertia and acceleration vectors in the ether. The ether is disturbing the CRT tube. The magnet is disturbing the ether, and the ether is disturbing the front of the CRT tube. It's not that the magnet is stretching all the way the hell out over here to the CRT tube. It is that the magnet is disturbing the ether, which is in return disturbing the CRT tube. I know this was a very dry video visually, but it's a very important one. So if you're interested in understanding magnetism and instantaneous action at a distance, it was important. Thanks for watching and a lot